Hey there, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God-given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern-day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 186 is titled, An Interview with Amanda Lawry. Hey there, Flute 360 er Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. So this conversation that I had with Amanda was completely fantastic. She and I recorded this episode back in October of 2021, and I had a great time learning from her. We talked about her compositional process, how she perceives the flute voice, and so much more. We also talk about ideas and ways to get minorities and composers who are considered minorities to get their compositions out there more. And how can we as performers do that? How can we support them? So with all that being said, we are, through the Flute 360 podcast, supporting women composers through this amazing international flute festival that's going down in February 2022. I have been blessed beyond measure to co-host this festival with Ron Royer and so many other people through the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra. The SBO is located in Canada, and Ron and the SBO, among the other affiliates, hold a special place in my heart. Please go to YouTube to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channels, both for the SBO side and through the Flute 360 side. If you are interested in hearing some of these newly commissioned pieces and works by female composers, you definitely want to join us for this flute festival through YouTube in February 2022. The first video is going to be released February 4th. I hope to see you there at the opening ceremonies on February 4th and also the closing ceremonies on February 25th. I wish you well. Have a great week, and if this series really excites you, please subscribe to the Flute 360 podcast because I would hate it if you missed out on this valuable free content. You don't want to miss conversations that I had with Elizabeth Rahm, Nora Schulman, Julia Mermelstein, Dr. Cleo Palacio Quinton, and last but not least, Dr. Laurel Swindon. So go ahead to your favorite podcast app, whether it's Apple, Spotify, or iHeartRadio, and hit subscribe. Thank you in advance. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute360 podcast interview. Before I introduce my lovely guest, I want to briefly introduce this amazing festival. So Ron Royer and I are co-hosting a flute festival, and it is going down February 2022. It is a co-hosted event where the SBO and Flute 360 are coming together and putting on this wonderful flute festival. It's going to highlight performers and winners of the video proposal. In addition to highlighting works by women composers. So I cannot wait to promote this event and this series is an inspiration for such campaign. But in addition, I get to make new friends along the way and that includes my wonderful guest for today and her name is Amanda Lawry. She is associated with the ACWC. She's a phenomenal composer, flutist, educator, improviser, sound designer, and arts administrator. She wears a lot of hats. So without further ado, help me welcome Amanda to the show. Hi. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? 
Good. How are things in Canada? Well, we are uh, back to doing things in person again, which is really lovely. I'm actually uh, a graduate student right now at the University of Toronto. So last year, things were uh, all online, which was a little bit challenging, but uh, it's really nice to be back uh, playing music with people in person again. Oh, good. Yes. So I did read through your biography that you are currently a DMA student. Mm -hmm. What year are you in right now? I'm in my third year. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, almost there. <laughs> yeah. So how was the second year being virtual? Yeah, I mean, it certainly, it, it had its frustrations, particularly teaching online, because, you know, when you're in the room with someone, you can really hear their sound. Whereas if it's over Zoom, it's like, well, is that is that you or is that the microphone, you know, and just helping students out with things like rhythm is really hard to do when there's latency and lag mm -hmm. to worry about. So yeah, there were definitely some challenges. But I think also, you know, being home all the time certainly made it a little easier to do a lot more reading and research and things like that. And get more into my own creative practice. And I've been working on recording an album. So yeah, they're, they're, it had its up, ups and downs, but I'm, I'm definitely happy that the rest of my degree is going to be hopefully uh, in person. Yeah. My heart really went out to students because I graduated in 2018 and the DMA program is, it is very intense, you know, and I cannot imagine like going through ensembles and rehearsals and like chamber rehearsals and how do you organize that and how do you navigate such a virtual world with a pandemic going on around you yeah i i feel especially bad for undergrads uh you know especially those who went into their first year last year because i you know my first year undergrad was just such a kind of eye opening experience for me and you know all the people that i met and uh just being kind of dropped into this this world of like playing all the time and playing all in all different ensembles and things like that. And I feel like as a graduate student, I've kind of done that and, you know, I still miss it, of course, but um, or, or have missed it. But yeah, I, I really, really feel bad for those first year undergrads who are, you know, moving, have moved to a new city for the first time. They don't know anyone and they've just had to be so isolated for the last year. So, yeah. I, I totally agree. And my heart went out also to my middle schoolers and my high schoolers too. You know, mm -hmm. that's such a weird season in your life anyways. <laughs> and yeah. being their teacher, you know, and just seeing them try to navigate this new world, my heart really ached for them. So it's been a tough few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, things are looking up though. <laughs> yeah, but things are looking up. And going back to... The introduction, you do a lot. And not only are you juggling these different hats, but you just said, you know, I'm currently a third year DMA student. <laughs> how do you find time for it all? How do you prioritize and how do you juggle it? It's very hard. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I would say that I'm particularly good at balancing things. I definitely have had a tendency in my life to overachieve yeah. <laughs> and overcommit. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to move away from that a bit. I'm trying, I think that was actually one of the things that was really good for me in the pandemic because my mm. calendar just like cleared all of a sudden. And mm. I had this experience of just, you know, having all of this time and uh, you don't really realize how like burnt out <laughs> you are until that happens, until you have the the space to reflect. And, you know, it's tough because I love all of the things that I do. And every time I think about letting go of something, taking something off my plate, it's just like, oh, but I can't let go of that thing because mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine not doing doing that, you know? So I think my, my main strategy is I, I try to be hyper-organized, a lot of to-do lists and schedules and things like that, but also like not as much as possible trying not to multitask, which I might sound a little weird given my bio, but just to, to sort of like chunk things off and say like, you know, this week or this month or even this year, like this is the thing that I'm focusing on. So, mm -hmm. so for example, right now, because I'm doing my DMA in performance, even though I'm still a composer and I, I will still write music from time to time, that's not my focus. That's not the thing that I'm kind of putting all of my energy to, towards. I'm, I'm mostly putting things towards, um, towards my flute playing and, and learning repertoire. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, it, it, it does feel like I'm being pulled in different directions all the time, but I, I try to manage that as much as I can by just blocking things off a little bit so I can wear one hat at a, at a time at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what I'm hearing is that you are honing in on this um, idea of batching, you know, wearing that mm. one hat for quite some time and saying, okay, right now I am going to wear that educator hat as long as I can. So that way you're not being pulled in several different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's not possible yeah. just because you have to, you know, deal with other people's schedules too. But yeah, as, as much as I can control it. Sorry, you were saying you do, you do the same thing. I try to do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I love lists. I love reminders. <laughs> and I have to be extremely organized else. I will feel like a chicken with its head cut off you know, and my friends will look at my emails with like everything being color coded and my reminders. And they're like, oh my gosh, you are so OCD. But I'm like, no, actually, if I'm not like this, I will be a hot mess. Yeah. I, I noticed that the first time I got an email from you, I was like, oh, this is a kindred spirit. This, <laughs> this person probably does a lot and, and knows how to stay organized. So oh, you're very <laughs> sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. So circling back to your composer hat, you are affiliated with the Association of Canadian Women Composers, or ACWC, for the listeners out there who may not know. When did your collaboration with the organization begin, and what's that process like? Unfortunately, that's actually a bit of a sad story in my case, because a dear friend of mine who was a, a member of the association, Rebecca Cummings, and a, a wonderful composer, um, she passed away a few years ago. And so it was actually at her uh, memorial service that I met Carol Ann Weaver, who is the outgoing chair of the ACWC. Um, she's been chair, I think, for like six or eight years or something like that. And so I met her there and uh, we ended up catching a ride home together with uh, a mutual friend and chatting a lot. And she kind of twisted my arm into coming to an ACWC concert that was happening uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then when I saw her there, she <laughs> twisted my arm further into joining. And I'm I'm so glad that she did because um, I've met so many wonderful people through the organization. And uh, I was I sort of went very quickly from being like newest member to being a board member. <laughs> um, a lot of arm twisting was involved again, but um, you know they they needed a, a treasurer because Janet Danielson, who'd been doing it for a number of years, uh, was stepping down. And I have arts admin experience and background, and I like numbers. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I've I've been doing that for um, I think close to a year now. And also, um, this year is the 40th anniversary for the ACWC. They were founded in 1981. Mm -hmm. And so that celebration, it's been really great. But obviously, the things that we had been planning a couple of years in advance, uh, we had to do a lot of pivoting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there was actually a concert just last week, which is going to be... Um, going to be live streamed in three days from now on October 7th, which had been scheduled for uh, right when the pandemic was started. So it got rescheduled, I think, about four or five times. And then finally, we were able to, to record it without an audience um, mm -hmm. last week. So yeah, and just to circle back to Rebecca, my friend mm -hmm. who, who uh, you know, indirectly is the reason that I joined the organization, she's actually written two flute pieces. Um, both both of which I commissioned. The first one was uh, called Embryo for Flute and Electronics. And then uh, the second one was called Fearless for Flute, Percussion and Electronics. And that one is actually on the concert that we recorded last week. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. And I am so sorry. My condolences to hearing about your friend. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've been with the ACWC for a year now. And not only is it, you know, honing your skill sets because you said you like numbers, do you find that, you know, when you work with a nonprofit organization that it's a great way to network? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So actually, uh, one of the things I was going to mention in uh, conjunction with the anniversary, uh, we 
are doing a project, which is almost done now, um, of monthly playlists of members of the ACWC. So they're just uploaded onto SoundCloud. And I, I volunteered to um, to curate these because it's sort of adjacent to my thesis research. So mm. um, it's it's uh, kind of killing two birds with one stone there a little bit. But yeah, it was, it's just been so wonderful to like get all these submissions from, you know, there's over a hundred members and uh, most of them have sent in their music for these, this playlist project. And um, yeah, I just feel like I have such a better understanding of like what the, what, what's out there, who's out there writing music in Canada, um, which I, I didn't really have before because, you know, unfortunately it doesn't get played very much. It's not, you know, there's yeah. still a lot of music by dead white men being yeah. played more than anything. So, um, yeah, it's just been really nice to be able to engage with that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or AKA the boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So you mentioned that you commissioned the piece embryo. What was the inspiration mm -hmm. behind that? Uh, behind the, like what she wrote. Mm -hmm. So I actually commissioned it uh, like it was a student commission. So this was in my technically fifth year undergrad because I did a double major. So they wouldn't let me do it in four years, okay. which is probably good. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just working towards my performance recital to cap off my my undergraduate degree and uh, looking for repertoire. And, um, you know, I really I really love to play electric acoustic music in particular. Um and she was, Rebecca was a student there at the same time as me in the composition program. And um, I I just loved her music. And I thought, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'd love for, for her to create something new for the flute. So that was, uh, that's why I asked her. And, and mm -hmm. I, I loved what she came up with and had a few opportunities to play it since then. And I hope to find more. I, I hope other people will, will play it as well. Um, I think actually... Laurel Swindon might be playing it uh, for the for the festival in February. Um, so, uh, yeah, and ho hopefully it'll continue to find its way to other flute players. Um, and then the second one, uh, Fearless, was actually kind of a similar situation. Uh, I was doing a chamber music diploma in 2017-2018. Uh, um, and uh, again, you know, flute, percussion, and electronics, there wasn't really much out there that I could find by mm. women. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really committed to playing music by women. Um, I think that's really important. And I, I think that things aren't really going to change in, until people kind of on an individual level start to make change. Um, and uh, playing gender balanced programs is, is a good way to start with that at the very least. So um, yeah, so I was looking, uh, I, I had a, a flute percussion duo already, and we were looking for repertoire. And um I uh, I suggested Rebecca because mm. you know she was continuing to create a, incredible music so mm. and uh, she did not disappoint she wrote a really amazing piece nice yes I couldn't agree more with you know promoting both and making sure both genders are seen so in the second piece it sounded like you really wanted a specific instrumentation to be mm -hmm. heard right? And you noticed a void and you said, hey, there's not a lot out here within this niche. Let's fill it. That's really interesting. Yeah. And that's something that I'm trying to like promote in, in a bird's eye view of notice, you know, through my podcast, like, hey guys, like if you want to get involved, you have to network what we're talking mm -hmm. about, collaboration, building those relationships and notice what's not been done. Notice the void mm -hmm. and and fill mm -hmm. it because then you are unique and you stand out among the noise because I don't know how many times can we hear the, you know, the old, <laughs> the older compositions of, you know, French works by flute and piano. I mean, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. But let's start, you know, filling those voids. Yeah. And I think it's not just what's not out there, but also what is out there, but is not being heard. You know, my first DMA recital that I'm working towards right now is going to be all flute music by Canadian women who are no longer living. So who kind of lived like in the in the 20th century for the most part. So I think the, the range of works is from about um, maybe 1930 up to 1980, um, more or less, because I think it's really important that we know our history a little bit more. You know, like I 
so much of what I do is playing music that's just been written, like premiering new works um, or, you know, written in the last 10 to 20 years. And and I love that and I, I'll never stop doing that. But I also think that there's this gap, you know, because like, especially with composers who are no longer living, they aren't around to promote their music anymore. So, you know, no one else is going to do it. And so I think that's really important. And also just like in terms of the accessibility to teachers and to students and to performers, like a young student flutist isn't going to pick up a piece, you know, like where there's no recording of it anywhere. They, they want to have heard it. They want to know something about it. Like that's a very um, brave thing to do, I think, to play something that that you don't have any kind of reference for. And I wouldn't expect a young flutist to necessarily be able to do that. So I, I, I'm kind of trying to make it my mission to record a lot of these pieces that are are wonderful, but like they haven't been played, you know, since 1950. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's just, there's nothing, uh, like one of the pieces, the only available recording is a cassette tape that somebody uploaded to YouTube. And, and it was like of the premiere performance in 1956 or something like that. So the quality is obviously not great. And um, yeah, I, I just, I really want to, I really want to get more of that out there and have it be available to people. Yes. Very well said. I love it. So in addition to being a composer, you are also an improviser. How has improvisation helped you, if at all, with your standard performances? Well, that's a really interesting question. I think it's helped me a lot with my composing. Okay. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Um, I think I use improvisation to compose a lot of the time. Um, and then so just kind of generate a lot of ideas and then go back and take take what I like and, and leave the rest. Mm-hmm. I think as a performer, so uh, because I do play so much contemporary music, there is actually often room for improvisation in a lot of newer works. Um, and I, I love when when that becomes available. Um, and even in the sort of performer-composer collaborative process, which I love so much to be a part of. So again, going back to Rebecca and, and Fearless, when, we were, when she was writing that, she actually met with me and uh, the percussionist I was working with. And uh, had us improvise together mm-hmm. and separately and just recorded uh, the sounds that we made. And, and she gave some directions and, you know, through, through, through some of her own ideas in. But uh, those improvisations ended up being a part of the electronics, which then informed how the live part was written. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, in a sort of roundabout way, I guess, <laughs> that that's really affected things. And I think in sort of, I guess, the more traditional part of my performance, I think I'm just a freer player, a more relaxed, comfortable player when I improvise. And I've just in the last few years (laughs) been able to, yeah, to translate that into my playing of fully written, uh, fully composed music um, Mm. to to be a little more free and a little more relaxed in, in my playing. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And my connection, I don't improvise maybe as often as I should, but (laughs) I feel like my practice of improv actually comes through podcasting because I can have an idea of the dialogue. I can do research on my guests and every, every talk, something else comes up and there's an ebb and flow and you have to be willing to go there and you may not know where that conversation is going to lead, but, you know, being comfortable in your own skin and your voice and your ideas that you would like to express, you got to go for it. And so I feel Mm -hmm. like when I pick up my flute, I'm just more comfortable because on the stage, like, again, you can prepare, you can practice the recitals program, but things come up. You hear crickets in the background or a baby's crying or maybe the pianist goes a little bit faster or slower and you have to adjust. And so I couldn't agree more with the sentiment of I'm more free on this stage when I improvise. So I was just kind of curious to tap and to kind of pick your brain on that subject. I think I just thought of another thing, actually, when I, my favorite way to improvise is with other people improvising on my own, you know, I'll do it, Mm. but, but there's something so special about the energy that another player can bring to an improvisation Mm. and the way that you can kind of feed off of each other and uh, just bounce things back and forth. And 
Um, I think that's another thing, that ability to connect and to really not just listen, but have that like energetic support, I guess, Mm -hmm. (laughs) is a thing that in chamber music, you know, we all aspire to. And I I feel like doing that in an improvisation setting has helped me to be able to do that more in more traditional chamber music settings. Yes, exactly. And (laughs) kind of, you know, going back to this idea of finding the parallels between like podcasting and being on stage of the hundred guests that I've had on my show, everybody has a unique personality. Everybody has a very unique energy and tapping into, I mean, for example, like right now you have such a sweet, kind, gentle (laughs) energy (laughs) and how crazy, I mean, I can still be Heidi, right? But how crazy would it be if I just came on being like extremely loud and boomy? And do you know what I mean? Like, it would be very stressful whoa. for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't want that, you know, um, that's counterintuitive. So, yeah, I mean, I'm still m- myself as an individual and I'm still myself as a host. But then for me to like match your energy for it to like flow and for us to have a really good time and for you to be comfortable. I think you have to read the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually funny that you mentioned that because so I first got into improvisation in my second year of undergrad. um, And it was because I there was an improv ensemble at Laurier where I where I studied and uh, they were doing auditions. And I I have this thing where when I'm like really afraid of a thing, I just do it (laughs) because I just, you know, I feel like that's an important part of personal growth is just to like face your fears. Mm. And so I, I just decided, okay, like I'm not, I'm never going to get in. I've, I've never done this before, but I'll just do the audition and then I'll, you know, know what that's like. And I was talking, uh, before, uh, the audition with a, an older student who had been part of the improv ensemble for quite some time and was kind of known uh, in, in the faculty as like one of the top improvisers, like she was really good. And, um, just telling her that I was nervous and some of my worries. And she said, well, like, and, and, you know, I said, I've never improvised before. And she said, you're improvising right now. (laughs) And that was, that was really kind of eye opening to me that like, yeah, we're always improvising all the time, just having a conversation, whether it's on a podcast or just like, you know, every day. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I checked out before our talk, your YouTube video where you improvised with a dancer. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me how that went down? So yeah, that was Tanya Williams. She's a physical theater artist as well as a contact contact improv dancer and teacher of contact improv. And this was another situation. uh, So I, I was, I was working in an arts admin role uh, for a theater company called Empty Space in Kitchener-Waterloo. And uh, Tanya is an artistic associate there. And uh, I had seen her do this contact improv dance thing, and I just thought it was so cool. But, like, I don't dance. <laughs> I don't like, you know, people looking at me when I'm moving. Like, <laughs> um, being on stage with a flute is fine. But, like, yeah, I would I would never have wanted someone to watch me move that way. Mm. And she had invited me to come to like a contact improv jam, just like an informal session. And it was like, well, this is terrifying, so I should do it. <laughs> so I did and actually met my partner there. So that was a good decision. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, I ended up going back like a bunch of times and really loving and it was very freeing. And And then Tanya and I so there was a collaboration between a uh, composer's collective that I was part of at the time um, and Tanya's sort of contact improv co- collective that she's part of um, where we, we did um, yeah, like a combination of our compositions and improvisations uh, with, with dance mm. and Tanya and I decided to just try and see like what would happen if, if, <laughs> if I played and danced with her at the same time. And there was a a lot of stuff to figure out because obviously, you know, the first time she, we tried it, she did something where she like got between my arms and pulled my flute away from my face, which makes (laughs) playing hard. So, you know, there there was a learning process there and, and obviously making sure that the instrument is safe. Mm. Um, And because I don't have the use of my hands for support of my body, making sure that, that, and, and she's very, very conscious about, you know, people's safety and not, not becoming injured. Um, Cause there's a lot of, uh, a lot of lifts, like a lot of weight transfer from one person to another. So mm. um, you, you want to be 
really stable and careful about how you're doing that sort of thing. So yeah, we've actually done it a few times in different contexts and it, it always feels a little bit different. And I think what we were talking about before about that energy transfer of, um, you know, two people talking or two people um, dancing or playing music together. It's really interesting how it, in that way, it's actually transferring from one like discipline or medium into another. So like her, the way that she is moving mm -hmm. um, and the way that she's sort of using her body with mine uh, for movement informs what I'm playing Yeah, um, and vice versa. I love that. Yes. Before I was a flutist, I actually was a ballerina. And oh, amazing. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And so a lot of the things, like even how I approach, you know, flute and like practicing just in my little, you know, studio and the relationship to my body and the stand and what I want to convey through a phrase, right? I find that a lot of my dance background really helps like mm. me to portray a musical line or, you know, thinking about the facial expressions and the body language. Like I think us as performers, we need you know, to really bring that music off the page. And how do we do that? Well, we have a lot of tools that we can use. Like I just said, facial expressions, body gestures, you know, using more of the space on the stage rather than just the little, like, I don't know, four by four <laughs> with your, you know, your body and the space between you and the stand, but understanding mm -hmm. the space around us, it can be yes. very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Have you ever done any performance that like used ballet and flute playing at the same time, like where you were dancing? Yes. I've actually have not been the dancer and the performer, but I okay. have done pieces where I'm the flutist and there is a dancer on stage. But that does bring up a good point. Like when you were talking about your work uh, previously, I was thinking, ooh, I've collaborated with dancers, but I actually have not been both the player and the dancer, that would be interesting. I think that would be really amazing. Yeah. yeah. Especially, I, I mean, as a solo piece, but also like if you had dancers with you um, mm -hmm. and you, you were dancing as well, that would be, that could be really interesting. Yeah. The last one that I did was, it was a while ago, but I played syrinx and then I hired a contemporary dancer. So it was not traditional by any means. I mean, she was doing very contemporary moves and... I absolutely loved it. It was done in Louisiana. And then I did another production out of one of my classes, actually, through the DMA program with Dr. Heather Warren Crow. And it was based off of her book. I forget the title of it. It was like Girl Plastic Something, but I'm putting my foot in my mouth. And so anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, I had choreographed a work where four dancers were conveying basically the message of the piece. And I was one of the dancers and there was art in the background and things like that. But I do love being in my body. It really helps me to feel creatively fulfilled and a great way to express myself. Well, if yeah. you ever decide that you want to commission a piece for Ballet dancing flutist. I know someone who would be perfect to write that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Thank you so much. Her name's uh, Julia Mermelstein. You might actually be interviewing her at some point because she's she's the incoming chair for ACWC. Very good um, segue. She, <laughs> <laughs> she um is yeah, she's done a lot of work for like music with dance. That's sort of her thing. Okay. She also wrote me a piece called Sunder, which is uh, for flute, piano, and electronics. And um, it doesn't have dance in it, but it there's some movement involved. So there's a point at which the flutist has to walk very, very slowly from one side of the stage to the other. Um, and it's so interesting to me, just like how challenging <laughs> something like that is. Like, how do you kind of maintain the... Um, the mood of the, you know, you, like you, you could, there's lots of ways to do it badly. <laughs> you could just <laughs> walk across the stage. You could, you know, have very sudden or uncoordinated movements. So like, yeah, we, I actually had to like really choreograph and rehearse, like how, how do I, which way do I turn? How slowly do I turn? What part of my body do I turn first? And, mm -hmm. you know, um, so anyway, uh, she, yeah, she's, she's someone who I think thinks a lot about movement in her writing and, and has written, uh, at least one really fantastic flute work. So I expect she could <laughs> do another one. <laughs> nice. Thanks for that referral. I love it. 
Something you said that was very interesting, it reminded me of an Eleanor Roosevelt quote, and that is, do one thing every day that scares you. (laughs) You said that, I think, at least two times within our conversation. Do you... I don't think I managed to do it every day. (laughs) That would be a lot. (laughs) I don't blame you. every few months, at least. (laughs) Yeah. Is there an inspiration behind that? Like, I have an idea, but I do not want to assume because assumption can be dangerous, but it sounds like you thrive off of that or I think so. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Is that fair to say? I think that not necessarily doing something that scares me, but challenge. Like I can't imagine a life without challenge. I just think that would be really boring and unfulfilling. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's just like playing a piece that's, that feels like it's too difficult for me and figuring out how to do it Mm -hmm. or, you know going to a contact improv dance session and like letting my body touch strangers yeah. <laughs> and dancing like that's yeah so and I don't necessarily do these things thinking okay this is going to become like you know part of my career or like a really important thing that I keep doing all the time but yeah I just I think that it's really healthy <laughs> yeah and good for for personal growth and fulfillment and all of these things to kind of look at those things that that feel really scary and and give yourself the chance to discover that actually like if if you go dance in front of people you're not going to die like it's not going to kill you <laughs> it might feel uncomfortable for a bit but um afterwards everything is going to be okay <laughs> yeah no that is a really healthy practice i love it and the reason why i wanted to highlight that is because it's so easy to stay within our comfort zone You know, Mm -hmm. but I think, you know, especially from this perspective of being an educator, you know, and when we ask our students, like, play off the page and see how loud you can get and connect with people. And to them, that could be really scary. And I think if we as educators can showcase, like, I, you know, and be able to communicate this to students and say, I know it's scary, right? I totally get it. Well, are you saying that from an experience that you had like 20 years ago, or are you still living? you know, a new day Mm -hmm. with new experiences and you feel like a student again, because when you're in that space of vulnerability, then you can easily, at least for me, I I think this could be true for a lot of people. Then you can easily go to said person and say, yes, I just took an audition again. I know that feeling of butterflies in the stomach. Let me help you with your audition. And you can connect with them a little bit easier as you're coaching them. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point. I ha- I mean, I, I am a teacher and I love teaching. Uh, and, and this actually is not a thing I had thought about before is how like this aspect of of how I how I do my life. <laughs> yeah, is like so relevant to teaching and how I can kind of bring that in. So thank you for, for pointing that out, because you're absolutely right. Like playing music is all about taking risks, especially like especially if you're doing it in front of someone yeah. <laughs> or in front of a lot of people. And and I think, you know, students are already taking a lot of risks just by going to school for music. Yeah. <laughs> That's a risk in, a, in and of itself. But um, yeah, just like reminding them about the importance of going outside of their comfort zone, even in something as simple as like play this louder or play it with more expression or mm-hmm. you know, anything like that. Yeah. No, I love this conversation. So do you intentionally say, okay, this week I'm going to do some skydiving? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love to go skydiving. Ooh. I haven't done that yet. Ooh. But uh, yeah, it's, I hear it's quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's like, I'm not, I'm not actively like seeking out things. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I feel like there's enough opportunities for doing things that are scary that just kind of like show up. Like being asked to be on a podcast, uh, for example, <laughs> that uh, it's it's more just like a matter of saying yes. Um, okay. And I think when I have the when I have the instinct to say no to something, I really try to take the time to interrogate why. Like, is it because I just don't want to do this? Like, it doesn't sound fun. It doesn't. I don't. I don't feel. I don't see the value in it. Or is it because I'm scared and okay. it makes me uncomfortable? And any time that I realize that it's because I'm scared and it makes me uncomfortable, then I, I sort of say to myself, well, then you should just do it. You'll, you'll live. It'll be fine. Yeah. Skydiving, you'll probably live, but it's, it's a different kind of risk, I guess. Hopefully. I do, I do really want to. I'm not afraid of heights. I like oh. heights. Oh, I'm terrified um, of heights. <laughs> I like heights, and I really, 
I like space and I really want to know what it's like. I mean, I'll never, you know, have enough money to go to space, but yeah. um, I'd really like to know what that like weightlessness feels like. Okay. So I feel like skydiving is a opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to find out. Don't they have like capsules or I'm going to totally sound crazy right now, but don't there's they like have- these air. Yeah. Like these rooms with like really high volume air. Yeah. That you can that float in. Recreate. Yeah. Yeah, I think now, so. If someone could write a flute uh, piece for skydiving flutists, <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> uh, calling for commissions, anyone who's listening yeah. to this. You, I wonder, like, with the air pressure, how that would affect the sound. Ooh. You'd have to get a really cheap flute to do this. I wouldn't want to use my, yeah. <laughs> and my regular everyday flute. And kind of flute. a quirky, fun, but real shout out. Maybe you need, like, a wind defender. Have you seen yeah. those things that snap on to the head joint? Yes, I have. Yeah. Um, for yeah, for when you're playing outside. Yeah. Uh, which I try not to do very much. I had a I had a <laughs> bad experience with mosquitoes one time. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. All Always right. pack bug spray if you're going to be playing outside. That's a very important lesson that I learned. Do you know a good mosquito repellent is actually um, tea tree oil. Tea tree oil. Okay. Yeah. You just put a little bit with a carrier oil, like a uh, coconut oil, and okay. you just rub it like on your ankles or back of your neck, wherever the mosquitoes try to, you know, bite you. Yeah. And it repels them. It would have to be a really good mosquito repellent because they <laughs> like me a lot. I don't okay. know why. <laughs> well, try tea tree oil and I okay. pray that you don't get bit up really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I will try that. Although I think we're out of mosquito season now, okay. thankfully, for for a little while at least. Next summer. <laughs> Next summer. Next yeah. summer. Oh, I love it. Cool. So we have talked a lot about different topics, various topics, and I love it. It was completely comfortable for me. I love picking your brain. Hopefully, it was comfortable for you because you said we're podcasting. So. <laughs> I'm an introvert. <laughs> okay. But no, yeah. like the reason why I was really picking your brain about, you know, stepping outside of your comfort zone is because I just find myself in the space of trying to mentor people to do that mm-hmm. and starting that dialogue and figuring out a really fun, encouraging, loving way to help people cross, you know, that threshold. And a lot of times, I mean, because for me, I thrive off of new experiences. I thrive Mm -hmm. off of building new relationships, making each day its own unique day, just because I am more fearful of the monotony of going about life and being like, okay, nine to five, come home, watch the news, go to bed. I mean, that scares me to the umpteenth degree. And so not that I'm perfect. There's a lot of things that I turn down because I am afraid. But when I hear people come to me and I coach people, I think, oh, just do it. But I know sometimes it's not that simple. Do you know? And so that's why I was kind of like curious to get inside of your head and that headspace of yours just to see your approach. Yeah, I think I was already sort of doing things this way before I I read this book. But uh, so there's a book by Brene Brown uh, called Daring Greatly. So uh, she's a... psychologist and researcher and she studies vulnerability and shame Mm. and uh, there's a there's a TED talk out there and uh, some other online resources but uh, yeah she the whole book is just is basically about that like just doing things that scare you and and how that will make your life better Mm. that's that's like such a terrible oversimplification (laughs) of what the book is about but if yeah if it, it is like you know, when you just read something and you're like, this is going to change my life. And also I need to buy like 20 copies of it and just like hand them out to everyone that I care about. Mm. (laughs) It was, it was very much that for me. So if, yeah, if you have some students who are really struggling with getting outside their comfort zone, I feel feel like that would be a good, good thing to throw at them. (laughs) Yes. What a great recommendation. So because we did cover a lot, I don't want to pull the rug out from underneath your feet and say, and we're done. (laughs) Because I know how that could feel. Are there any last sentiments that you would like to leave the listener with? Oh, that's such a hard question. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It is very general. So I apologize for being too broad. (laughs) Um, 
Well, at at the at risk of you know beating a dead horse, um, play music by women. That's mm-hmm. yeah. I just I just want more people to play music by women because it, it, you know, it's 2021. Yeah. <laughs> We've been having these conversations for a very long time, and there's so much good music out there mm-hmm. that's just not getting played. And um, I just every time I. I look at a concert program and I just see all men. It just, I just, it feels like just such a shame, you know? Yeah. So, and, and I know that there are, there are barriers and challenges and, um, but I think the more people do it, the easier it gets. True. I couldn't agree more. And to kind of wrap up that sentiment, this is a great way to end our conversation If you want to hear more compositions by female composers, check out February's 2022 festival with the SPO and Flu360. It is going down through the SPO's YouTube channel. You get to hear phenomenal performers of these female compositions or compositions by female composers, and we cannot wait to see you there. So thank you, Amanda, for your time, talents, and expertise. I am so thrilled that we got to meet, and I love making new music friends. So thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Okay. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to today's content. If today's episode really resonated with you, you definitely want to subscribe to the Flute 360's YouTube channel. There, you will not only find this content in audio format, but as a special bonus, I don't do this very often, but as a special bonus, I have uploaded our videos so you can see myself and my guests in action throughout the month of January of 2022. Go ahead and subscribe to the Flute360's YouTube channel. Type into the search engine Heidi K. Begay and it will pop right up. Thank you in advance for your support. Let's talk about Flute.